this is Arthur and Kathleen broadcasting from St. Moritz on this uh, yeah uh, on this January t- January eighteenth two thousand eighteen. So uh, I've been doing this update since around October, and in general, what I do is go through a list of. Uh, the works that people who are working on Tezos are doing. Uh, and I, I want to change it up a little bit. Uh, why? Uh, there's a bigger team now. And a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the work that's being done, a lot of the updates every week are not necessarily worth discussing. Um, they're small stuff. They're incremental. Um, they're incremental improvements. They're all important work, but it's not necessarily the best. Uh, a, vid- a video is not necessarily the best video for that. So I want to point people to um, our GitLab, uh, we, you know, Many people are familiar with GitHub, uh, but we use GitLab mainly. And so if you go to gitlab.com slash Tezos slash Tezos slash activity, you'll get a sense of what's going on in terms of development. You can see all the comments, but you can also see the issues being open, comments on different branches. Uh, the GitHub only shows uh, one branch. So that will give you a better uh, better sense of the uh, weekly progress. And what I want to do in these videos in, um, going forward is discuss uh, a theme uh, uh, that we've been working on uh, more generally. So one important theme that I mentioned last week is documentation. So uh, work on that continues. Uh, you can go to the website doc.tzalpha.net, um, and that makes it easier for newcomers to uh, get started with the code and contribute. Uh, so more effort towards documentation. More efforts also towards testing. Um, one of the uh, developers has been working on a testing um, framework for our peer-to-peer layer. So that's, uh, that's important. The peer to peer layer on the first impression, you might say, well, that, that's not necessarily um, so important because, you know, if, if some reason you get disconnected, it's a big network, um, you, you're, it's, it's, it's decentralized, you can lose a node, sure. But if you have a, a global bug that disconnects all of your network and your chain splits, or worse, if you can send crafted instructions that somehow disconnect the nodes, that would be bad. And so you have consensus critical things that can happen in the peer-to-peer layer. Uh, what's more, uh, the peer-to-peer layer in Tezos, which can have messages coming from multiple protocols and which can have um, operations and blocks which are cheap to create, is trickier to implement and in a proof-of-work based currency. So uh, it's important to add our test coverage. It's something I've been uh, mentioning for a while, and I'm happy that uh, we're doing this now. So the main theme I would like to discuss this week is cost accounting. So one of the main uh, principle of Tezos is that a lot of what happens on a blockchain is a commons. Uh, so innovations in the commons in a, uh, is a commons in a blockchain, but there are other commons. One of it is uh, gas. So you have a certain amount of validation time that you can have between blocks. Uh, in a system like Bitcoin, where the time to compute a script uh, is not very different from the size of the script. There's not a whole lot of variation between opcodes. It's not something that's very important. It's more important in something like a smart contract platform where you may have different computations. So gas um, is a scarce resource, and it's a scarce resource per block, which is why it's raised by a transaction fee. Now, there's another scarce resource on a blockchain, which is storage space, You know how much space you're taking. And in Bitcoin, the way this is addressed is with dust. Uh, Bitcoin says, you know, if um, if your transaction is going to cost you on a, if if your TX out is going to cost you on average a lot more, uh, a large fraction of the TX out has to be spent in fees in order to to spend it. That's considered dust and there's a penalty, and that prevents people from just spamming Bitcoin with a very large UTXO set. Uh, and so in Tezos, um, the way that uh, I'd like to address uh, this is by setting a cost for every byte of storage that you use. Um, and there's a um, there's an idea which is that uh, every storage byte that you create has to be created by your gas cost. And so uh, the naive version would be to say, hey, since you've paid for gas, you've implicitly paid for the cre- for the storage of that data, and so you don't need to pay more. But that's not quite true because demand for uh, gas could be very low. And so you could have a very low gas price, but you would still take some space on the blockchain. So it has to be a special price per byte that you're paying for um, storing data in a contract and even storing the code of the contract. Um, And so another aspect is you can think of the storage space of a blockchain as having two sides. One is the total size of the blockchain. Uh, How much are you uh, storing when you store the blockchain from the genesis block to the current block. And the other one is the size of the, of the state. Uh, so in Bitcoin, that would be the set of UTXO. For Tezos, it's you know all the contracts, all the data stored in the contracts. And I think the storage space 
the, the latter is a lot more important uh, for several reasons. Why? One is that we're proof of stake anyway. So the idea is that you need to keep the blockchain from the Genesis block to reconstruct everything from the Genesis block doesn't even make sense in proof of stake. And so you can probably just say, hey, if, you know, if you're a librarian and you're interested in that, you can store all the blocks, but it's completely fine for a node to just uh, keep a trailing queue of, uh, of blocks. So the first thing is that it doesn't actually um, uh, really matter what is the total size. So, And the size of the state is also a lot more important because this is what you might have to load in memory if you want to do operations. So in terms of validation, this is really what you should be focusing on and not necessarily all the blocks that you need to store because maybe some bootstrapping node is going to ask you for, um, uh, for those nodes. Uh, and uh, Ethereum makes that distinction fairly well, and it's, uh, it's a good distinction. It's an important distinction. So uh, most of the costs should be focusing on that, which means refunds, for example, if you have operations which reduce the size of a contract and fees if you have operations which increase the size of a contract. Another aspect of cost which needs to be handled uh, properly um, in Tezos is deserialization cost. So in Ethereum, the storage space of a contract uh, it's, 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 it's basically bits. You're loading bits literally from your disk. You're mapping that in memory and you're loading and, and you're writing your code. And so you can have a very large storage. It's going to be the operating system is going to do, to do this lazily for you. So you don't have, you don't have a cost of deserialization because the deserialization of any high level structure you might have happened at the level of the EVM. We have a high level VM, which means that the data that we store is high level data. So there's a cost of deserialization that we need to take explicitly into account in gas. Even your contract is serialized. And so you're going to have to pay for the cost of deserializing the contract first and then loading it. So that's a price you have to pay for the benefits of being type safe. Um, but if we move to hash counseling, I have a blog post discussing that, then you can even hash cons your program. You can, all, you can load only the parts that you want to use. Now, speaking of which, I've been mentioning the implementation of a big map. And so that's something you can, um, I think that's been merged into masters. That's something you can try now is creating these very large uh, associative maps, uh, which are um, deserialized lazily uh, in Mikkelsen. And this is implemented explicitly so that people can create subtokens, for example, where you need a large map mapping uh, user address to, um, uh, to an amount, for example. So we're setting up um, the accounting for storage. We're setting up the accounting for um, the deserialization cost and typing cost of contracts. And I don't know, um, you know, I I don't know what the values should be for that. I my intuition is that it would be probably best for Tezos to start with fairly conservative value, make it expensive to store data, make it expensive to um, to run computations until. Um, we get a sense of how uh, how the blockchain handles it, and then you can crank it down. It's very it's much easier to take these values high and then crank them down than to set them too low and say, oh my god, now we have uh, two gigabytes of states, and how what, what do we do with that? Anyways, so uh, I'll be back in Paris next week, and I'll have another update uh, at that time. In the meantime, cheers.